Good. Okay. Welcome everyone to our April board meeting. Ms. all stand and Brian will lead us in the flight briefing. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll start agenda with, uh, of course, approving the minutes. The regular town board meeting, March 13th. Have a motion. I'll make that motion. Brian? Uh, second. Second by Bob. All in favor? Aye. Everybody say aye. 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 Uh, next agenda, of course, is our notice of public hearing. For the purposes of hearing comments, the amendment of local law number one, 2024, Article 8 of Chapter 163. Of the Warrensburg Code enforcement penalties on short term rental, clarifying its requirements and providing progressive penalties for non compliance. Do we have the clerk read the notice, please? Mm -hmm. uh, please take notice that the Warrensburg Town Board will hold a public hearing on April 10th, 2024, beginning at 7 p.m. at the Warrensburg Town Hall. Uh, concerning proposed local law number one of 2024, amending Article 8 of Chapter 163, Enforcement and Penalties on Short-Term Rentals of the Warrensburg Town Code to clarify its requirements to provide and progress penalties for a compliance, for non-compliance. All persons interested will be heard at this time and place. A copy of the proposed local law is available for public inspection, which is also on the table in the town clerk's office at 3797 Main Street. Okay, thank you. We'll open this public hearing. Does anyone wish to comment on the local law amendments? Okay. To the microphone, state your name, address. Elena Morgan from Warren Street in Warrensburg. Um, I just have hopefully just two comments really and maybe something for the board to consider. In paragraph two, um, there's not really any relative change from what the existing local law says, but I thought it might be something for the board to think about. It talks about how if there's a third or subsequent violation of any of the terms of this chapter, um, that the permit could be revoked. And I was wondering if it's, if you thought putting some different language in there about having it be like the same violation or does it mean any violation and forever put some time limits on it because what I was thinking was let's say you get a violation because of over occupancy then two years down the road you get a violation for garbage and then five years down the road you get a violation for noise so that's three violations overall of a long-term permit probably generally the property owner is doing their due diligence and just had some bad bad tenants at one time or another or bad guests so i thought it might be something for the board to consider that maybe in that paragraph you say either a time limit x number of violations within one year two year three years or you say this violation of a similar vein or a violation of the same clause of the code so that was one point i thought might be worth considering and then the other point is in section D about the penalties. Um, it says on a first conviction for a violation of this chapter. And I just didn't know, does that mean that it has to go through a criminal court to be convicted of the violation? It does. Okay. So then as I understand that, then the code enforcement officer can't issue the fines. It has to be after a court decides. Evidently, yes. Yes, the code enforcement that has to go to court. You can't just discuss it. And then my thought would be in accord with that, since the penalties are listed, it, I was thinking that um, the, uh, the amount of each fine, it says that they shall be such an amount per day. Might it be wise to put something in there that it could be a discretionary amount or subject to um, the terms of the judge or if the judge thought within a reasonable amount or based on the efforts made by the by the owner? That might be another thought that could be included in that. Something for the board to consider. That was really all. Otherwise, we're all very happy with the short-term rental laws in our town, and we appreciate that. 
the, the fines were so little before that people who weren't getting them from that were just flat out ignoring us right. and weren't caring. So we, it became like so easy for them to just say, yeah, whatever, it's a small fine and we'll just run it. But when it becomes teeth, you know, when the teeth we can collect them. Right, exactly. And I think everybody here understands that, but when we're putting it into the code, maybe it might be wise to consider putting some kind of stipulation. There's a little bit of different wording in there to have it be more defined as to what the intentions of the board are. Take consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Not the place that we're. Joyce Reed, Warrensburg. Uh, just a quick might be for Jackie, but most of our short-term rentals are under LLCs. Does that prevent us from any, give them any rescue from liability for fines, re revocation of their permits? Would be our position that no, it does not. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. For clarification. Sorry, I don't generally take that's, that's okay. Okay. That's okay. Sorry. Hey, Wells, Jim. Jim Hall, code enforcement officer. From the code enforcement aspect of this thing, uh, when I issue a permit to somebody, I tell them it's a three strike law. That's why we have zero problems in the town of Orangeburg. Because if you, I don't care if you screw up this year, next year, and the year after, three times I can revoke your permit. You can go to court. You can go back to the town and you can plead your case and claim it was temporary insanity. That's why this, all this was going on in your building. But that's why we don't have any problems here. The, the only problem with this is that the stated amount is uh, $200 for the first offense. It can, I just dragged on with a guy here for three months who was renting a property, didn't have a permit, back and forth and back. He, he, he was intelligent enough to buy a piece of property and sign the deeds and the mortgage, but he just couldn't somehow fill out that application mm -hmm. to get a short-term rental permit. A lot of these other towns have got all this dance around stuff in their laws, and they have all these different problems with this dance around stuff. Uh, it should stay at, you know, at three shots, and if you lose your permit, then you can come in and appeal it and say, we'll do better next time. But people knowing that you've only got three bites of the apple, make some control who's in their buildings and they keep better control of them. I mean, I had one person tell me the only person I, I had one person in court of all the properties we got one time. And she said to me, well, we don't like to get up at nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night and go check on our building. And I said, well, the neighbors next to your building want you to get up and check on it. And you're the one that's renting it out to all these wahoos. The town's not going to go right hurt them. So I said, this is your first shot in court. You got two more and you won't be renting your property. We've had zero complaints after that. Has to have, it has to have teeth in it. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Anyone else? Amy. Hi, uh, Amy Langworthy. Um, I wasn't here to talk about this, but since it came up, I would like to, and I didn't have a chance to read through all of this, but I uh, just something I think that the town should consider um, and this may or may not be popular with some people, but as you're going to see in our presentation and school and enrollment trends in our community and the larger state, I think that um, looking at the number of short-term rentals that we have in our community and looking at enrollment trends and hearing time and time and time again from families who would like to move into our community but can't find housing I think that it's probably long past overdue that the town look at ways to maybe put some potential more restrictions on short-term rentals, even equating to potentially the number of days that are is allowable. And maybe that looks different for people who actually reside in our community who own short-term rentals versus people who don't live in our community year round because my concern is that if you continue to sell properties to uh, whether they're companies or people who don't live here year round, you're not, you're not gaining families 
you're not adding to our community, you're not adding people who care about our community, that leave our school, that you want to come back to our community and make a living and live here and contribute back to the community, I'm sorry, but the short-term rentals aren't doing it. They're not helping and school enrollment continues to decline, not just here and not just out in other communities. I'm not saying that the short-term rentals are the only reason why. I know jobs are an issue as well. However, short-term rentals are not helping our community as far as population growth, as far as people contributing to our community, sustaining and caring about it. And I think that um, you really need to take a long term because if, if you don't have people who live here year round, you don't have a community and you won't have a school. Very My thoughts. Anyone else? I think we'll leave the, the hearing open for a little while, let people think about it. We'll proceed with uh, the 2025 budget review from the superintendent and business manager from school. And so we'll get out of the way so they can use your projector, fellas. We can go down front, we don't have to. We'll leave the public hearing open for a while. Set it this way. It will catch you. I'm going to turn it this way. It will catch you. That's fine. Other people know. It will catch you. It's just going to take a minute to move back up. Be patient, please. Okay, uh, so I'll just start. So uh, if anybody doesn't know me, I'm Amy Langworthy. I'm the superintendent of schools. Uh, previously, I was elementary principal for 15 or 16 years. I've been in the superintendency now for um, two and a half years, or a little over that, I guess, around there. Um, Jen, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Jennifer Switzer. I'm the business manager. And um, in my fourth year here um, at Warrensburg, previous to this, I was um, with the town of Queensbury and economic development. Um, on the private side um, in the area. Okay. So uh, thank you for allowing us to come and present our um, school budget uh, to the town. Uh, I would like to say that we have final um, numbers and budget um, uh, is pretty much complete at this point, but I'm sure you're all aware and have probably seen in the news a fair amount about the, the hit that public schools took this year. I'll just quickly, because I know I have a um, timer going right now, according to <laughs> Mrs. Reed over there. But um, so, uh, but just wanted to give you a quick, the schools in the state currently have taken a fairly large hit. Uh, we've taken over a million dollar hit um, in foundation aid and what's called hold harmless. So basically in a quick nutshell, all schools have been, even though enrollment numbers have declined across New York State, the state has continued to fund schools at the same level um, that they've been funding them, even though enrollment has declined. And you could say enrollment, you know, if you don't have as many students, you don't get the same amount of aid, but they have given the same amount of aid because, you know, you still have to pay for electricity, you still have to pay for buildings, transportation, inflation costs, and, you know, if you have... 20 kids in a classroom versus 14 kids in a classroom, you still need a classroom, you still need a teacher. So that was kind of the thinking behind that. I'm not saying that um, the formula in that whole harmless don't need to be corrected because it is in fact true that enrollment has declined across the state for various reasons. Um, but uh, schools were not given any warning this year that this was coming. It would have been very different if last year they, they would have said or kind of um, I guess, rolled it out incrementally over a couple, two or three years saying next year, you know, be prepared to lose 20 percent the following year, 15 percent and such. So schools could plan accordingly. 
um, and try to make adjustments as we need to. Um, that didn't happen. It was just kind of a surprise even to the legislator um, that this was coming. So I know that there have been a lot of lobbying efforts on multiple groups part to try to um, kind of push that off a little bit and give schools more time to prepare. So we're hopeful that will happen. Um, and we're thinking we could get some or potentially all of it back for this year. But Jen and I are not um, thinking that this is going to be a long-term solution. And we do know that um, we need to really make some adjustments and kind of what we kind of talk, talk about frequently is kind of right-sizing our budget based on enrollment, looking at staffing needs, things like that to match what um, we as a school can provide and what our community can afford. So um, with that in mind, um, it's not finalized yet. We do have to adopt our board. Our board has to adopt the budget at our next meeting, which is on April 22nd. So if numbers don't change from the state prior to that, uh, we can't change it at that point. The budget is the budget that we adopt. So we can't get vote on a budget that's going out to the voters in May and the state comes back and says, oh, by the way, we're gonna give you another half a million dollars. Well, at that point, we can't, you know, we can't bring positions back. We can't because the, the budget is already the one that's adopted. So we are under a little bit of a time crunch. So you're gonna see a couple scenarios of that. So I apologize for this, but I just wanted to, I'll show you another one you can see. So you can see um, some of the enrollment trends that I was, I was referencing before when I was talking about concerns in, in small communities like ours um, and trying to kind of attract, you know, families who want to reside here year round. So this is a concern. You can see the difference in our enrollment from 1993 to 2022. So in all districts pretty much around us have taken some, some pretty big hits as well. Some even larger than ours. Um, and you can see this is in New York state you can see the primary and secondary enrollment declines, um, again, for a variety of reasons, but it is a fact that I think most of us are, are well aware of. And you can see this is the Adirondack region in particular, um, and you can see the areas in, in red of a loss of 25%, um, 10%. And so you can see that um, our adult pool, and generally people are having fewer children, um, Jobs are an issue, lots of factors, but you can see that the Adirondack Park has taken a pretty big hit. Again, you can see the kind of percentages of increase of uh, changes in population. Smaller towns like north of us, such as Indian Lake, well, I know Lake George, um, enroll Lake George's enrollment numbers are lower than ours right now. They have been for the last couple of years. So um, it's a concern region-wide for us and our VOCs. Um, some of the needs that we've tried to still address um, over the last couple of years is you can see that we have um, tried to increase our counseling caseload. Social workers have pretty much stayed the same. Our school psychologists, administration has stayed the same. We have added um, therapists, which is more counseling to provide for our students and families that is housed in our schools in both the elementary and the high school. And this year, we added a school resource officer to address safety needs as well. Um, our goal was to hire two resource officers, one for both buildings, but we weren't able to secure two. So um, we've had one who's doing a great job and goes between the building and actually it seems to be working out okay. But so you can see over the last few years, the trend has been to try to provide a lot of supports for students for um, from a social emotional perspective because our kids for a variety of reasons are coming in with some more trauma, some more mental health needs, social emotional needs, um, and that's been a big concern in our school. Poverty levels have increased dramatically, um, you know, um, over the last 15 to 20 years in our region. And when you have children who are living in poverty, you have a lot of issues that come along with that as well. Um, so those are some of the issues that we've been trying to address. In our 2024-25 budget, um, some of the priorities stayed the same from previously. Obviously, we've had some more challenges this year from a fiscal perspective, trying to find ways to uh, balance the budget and keep the tax levy to the taxpayers um, at, a, at a very reasonable rate uh, that people can afford. But we do want to maintain quality courses and electives. 
you know, our students who are here in our district, even though it's a small district, should be able to have the same opportunities um, as students in larger districts do. Uh, you know, we want them to, whether it be going to college or going to a trade field or whatever, to be competitive and be successful, whatever that may look like to them. Technology um, application and integration um, opportunities outside the classroom. We've really done a lot with our CTE and trades program. I think last year when I met with this group, we talked about our construction trades program. Uh, we have our capital project coming up this year, this summer it's starting, which has been a whole other host of headaches. But um, so that will renovate our complete um, tech area in our high school to put a state of the art um, construction trades program we already have been given the certification process, which took about a year to get from the state. So we do have students coming from other districts who are participating in our construction trades program. Um, I'm part of a workforce coalition group that is um, made up of um, plumbers, contractors. Uh, Curtis Lumber is a big um, uh, spearheading that group, um, big contracting firms from Glens Falls and Saratoga, the Pipe Fitters Union. All of that i sit on a committee with them to try to find opportunities and ways that our students can find ways to be successful in the trades um we all know the cost of student loan debt for our students and many of our students can't afford it um, we can give them um, opportunities for pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeship program in the trades and they can earn a very very good um have a nice career and be able to hopefully stay in our region and have and contribute to all of our communities both here and and regionally um so being sensitive to the economic climate right now which we all know is not good um and the tax burden and try to when i mentioned uh right sizing our um staffing going forward and align our we have a long-range plan that gets updated every year focused on academics, wellness, community engagement. Um, we added character as a component for this year for both students and staff as well. So we're updating that on an annual basis. Um, and so our budget should be aligned to what our goals are in the district. So those are kind of our budget um, priorities. Because of our foundation aid cuts this year, these are, um, Jen's going to go into a little more specifics with the budget in just a minute, but some of the cuts that we have made for this coming school year include um, reduction in staffing, and we really try to kind of share the wealth for, or lack of wealth for better in all of our departments across the district so that not just one department took a hit, but we did um, reduce four teaching assistants into eight positions, three teaching positions, two teachers who are retiring will not be replaced um, and a cleaner position was not filled. We are looking at, in addition to the foundation aid and hold harmless cuts, we had an increase of 17% in our health insurance and we do belong to a consortium, which is getting us ironically the best rates, but we till, still took a 17% increase. We received um, notice uh, just a week or two ago that we have an $80,000 increase in our electricity costs um, as well, looking at us. And then we're um, really looking forward to the electric bus initiative that the state has asked the districts to roll out by 2027. So that's been um, a, a, a lot of time investigating and trying to find out more information about that. So just being mindful of all of those things that we're looking at. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Jen to talk to you a little bit about the, the numbers and all of that for you. So having said all of that, um, we still have a 3% increase. And again, a lot of that has to do with the increase in health insurance. We do have a couple of unions that were mandated to increase their salaries. So that has added to it, along with things like um, the basic, keeping the, the buildings electricity, supplies, just like in your home, um, the school district is doing the same thing. It's um, a 3% increase and again about uh, $767,000. Um, one of the reasons that we've had to cut staff, you can see from this graphic, about 70% of our budget is salary and benefits. So there's, even though we looked at every line item within every department, there's very few ways <coughs> that we can find a million dollars except looking to staff. Um, that was obviously our last resort because they provide um, 
the meat of what we do for our, the students in the community. So unfortunately, um, that's why we had to make the cuts. That's why you see um, the teaching assistants, the aides, and the teachers not either being replaced or being cut because 70% of our budget does come from salary and benefits. Um, and you talked a little bit about, um, not a little bit, a lot about state aid, um, foundation aid specifically. And along with state aid, um, we also obviously collect property taxes as part of our revenue, other um, sources. So the majority of that comes from um, penalties, uh, basically from the taxes and interest from um, our accounts that we have. We also appropriate fund balance. Um, hopefully it's something that you as board members are aware of. It's basically the um, equity that we have, the additional equity the savings um, per se that we have. We don't like to utilize that. Unfortunately, this year we're going to have to use quite a bit of that, but we have done a good job with long range planning and are in a position that we can use, um, we can use some of that money. And hopefully if we get reinstated with some of the uh, foundation aid, we can build those back up again. This um, just gives you um, some detail about the foundation aid. That's the very top line and that million dollar um, cut that you can see there, which was again, significant 10% um, of what we normally get. These are the other state aids that come along with um, foundation aid. And even though you see some gains, about $200,000 in expense based aids, what that means is school districts basically the state uses what we spent last year to project what we'll get in those expense based aid so it's building aid it's um aid for special education so unfortunately we can't really i need to utilize those that revenue and those funds in order to support the programs that we already have in place to pay debt service again to pay for our special education so although um it's only an $802,000 hit that we took um, net. It's really a million dollars when you consider what we have to do, again, to maintain those programs that we um, expensed last year. Nothing is simple in education and in the state of New York. Uh, this just gives you a little bit of an idea of um, the big picture. The top line is what we're looking our budget to be, what we're looking to spend, and it's $23,773,000. Our revenues, less what our um, increase in taxes that we're proposing, left us with a two point, almost $3 million um, budget gap. So again, um, we looked at things like, um, unfortunately having to increase the tax levy, uh, $237,000, although, um, there's a couple of slides uh, later on. This tax levy, the proposed tax levy, the 3%, is actually lower than what the tax levy was in 2016 or 17. So the district has done a really good job of trying to um, mitigate big spikes in uh, the tax levy. And even though it's a 3% um, increase, it's still lower than what it was in 2016-17. We, along with the fund balance, you'll see that um, it's almost $1.7 million, that savings that I spoke about, that's also going to help us balance the budget. But we also have reserves that we'll be utilizing. We have retirement reserves that we'll be using. Unfortunately, we'll have to use some unemployment reserves because of um, losing all of those positions, as well as an equipment reserve. Uh, we do need to purchase a van for our transportation department, and we do have a capital equipment, bus, and vehicle reserve that we can tap into. So um, the other thing that this, I, I just want to point out with this is um, we will be, as I mentioned before, we will be decreasing the amount of the savings or fund balance that we have. And that um, hopefully will be taken care of if we get our money back from the state and we can build those up again. I just wanted to give you um, because everything is in flux, um, our board at our meeting on Monday night decided that if for some reason we get the foundation aid back, they would like us to 
not increase the tax levy by 3%, but by 2%. So this just gives you an idea of, um, again, where that 2% would land us. And ultimately what it will do is, again, put more money back into that savings, give us the opportunity to continue to do the long range planning, to keep our facilities up, to continue to give um, our students the programs that are necessary. And then, um, again, this just is kind of giving you, um, without all of that, all those other numbers in there, an idea of with the 3% tax levy, you're looking at $237,000. A 2% tax levy, you're looking at $158,000 increase. I, I spoke earlier about how our um, tax levy is below the 2016-17 um, tax levy, which is to the far right behind that chair. But this gives you an idea, again, of um, the district and the great job that they've done. The bottom green is the actual tax levy. Um, the orange is state aid, and the blue is actually the amount of expenditures that we've had. So you can see what a great job that they've done, again, to, for the community to keep that tax levy steady and so people can know from year to year what to expect, not see huge spikes and increases, which is what we really want to do. And what we're hoping we'll be able to do again this year by using all of those savings and reserves that we have. Um, I spoke a little bit about that we'll need to um, purchase a van. We also will need to lease three buses. We lease all of our buses. They're on a five-year rotation. We need three buses um, this year, 66 passenger buses. Uh, this is another area where our budget took a hit. This um, tripled uh, from when five years, the lease that it's replacing, the five-year lease. So buses have seen almost um, a 60% increase over a five-year period, which is, again, um, not good news for us. And the closer we get to uh, the state's mandate for the electric buses, the more expensive we're seeing our diesel or our gas-generated um, vehicles and buses. Um, this is the $90,000 for the van. Again, this is something that we're required to put out to the voters that will be using the capital equipment and bus vehicle reserve. So again, it's not going to um, impact or increase that tax levy. We'll be using, again, some savings and some reserves to do that. And lastly, there are two board positions open. Um, Doug West and Elaine Cowan will um, be finishing their um, tenure on the board and they will not be real as far as I know I don't think they'll be running but um, whether they do or not there'll be two positions open you if you're interested you have until April 22nd to um, get the paperwork from the school district and file it in the business officer I'm actually the district clerk as well so um, if you're interested you can let me know you can stop by the school you can call us you can go on the website um, and that is start that commence on July 2024 and it's a four year term. And then lastly, this is just some information about our voting. It's taking place May 21st from 12 until 8 p.m. the junior senior high school um, outside of the gymnasium. Um, one thing that I did want to point out is along with the absentee ballot, we, the school districts will be the guinea pigs for the early mail in ballots as well. Um, it, this is something, again, that uh, we kind of found out last minute. The state um, passed the law for the early mail-in ballots, and they decided that why not throw it onto the school districts? We'll test it out with them. Um, so we'll be, if you're interested, you can get not only an absentee ballot, but you can also contact our office and get an early mail-in ballot um, if you'd like as well. And that's really all we have unless anybody has any questions any comments and i just wanted to say that even with the the struggles that we've had with the budget this year we did not eliminate any programs for students um we still are offering a couple of years ago we switched from ap classes for students who are looking for college credit and switched to all of our uh, college credit classes are either through suny adirondack suny albany or syracuse university 
So they don't have to worry about what grade they get. They pass the course. They meet the criteria. So I think at this point, our students, if they took all of them, could potentially get up to almost nearly 30 college credits, um, which is a big savings for those kids who want to go to college. And I mentioned the CTE. We are looking at expanding our CTE of trades offerings to uh, potentially our facts, our home and careers program down the year in culinary, down the road in culinary. And we are looking to offer a firefighter EMT CTE certified trades program this coming fall. Um, I've been working with BOCES on it. Um, it would be a one-year firefighter program and a one-year EMT program. We wanted to start the EMT program this year. We're having a hard time finding a teacher for the program. Anybody knows anybody who is five in it? We're looking for a teacher. We have a classroom available for high school, and we'll open that up to other districts as well. So um, we've off, all of our co-curriculars are still in place. Everything we, we were able to not um, cut any programs still, um, and still reduce our staffing, and we'll continue to be very mindful when people do retire, um, whether they, they need to replace or not. So to try to manage our budget as we move along um, and deal with some of the reductions that we're going to see at the same level as well. So. Amy, I assume all the districts are facing this. Yeah. Besides like the ones on the lake where they have Google unbalanced. Well, but yeah. They're right. only like think about 10% you figure with, with their um, they took? We took a bigger hit than some districts do. Um, some districts did. Um, but there was a, most of the districts that took a significant hit were smaller rural districts in the state yeah um so obviously when we have communities such as like Oakland, who have they have such a small enrollment but they have so little state aid because they have so much on the way from home so uh, even a reduction in state aid for a district like that is not a huge hit because they don't get a lot but districts you know a lot of our districts including ours who rely a lot on state aid when you lose 10 percent that's a big chunk of your budget yeah. The, the positions, the teaching positions, what subjects were they in? Uh, um, it, was, I was, it was probably because of student decline, you know, the enrollment, because you didn't need four, four teachers for, for the one subject, you're not like two kinds of that. Yeah, so so um, a, a couple of things. So we had, uh, we had a special education teacher and a reading teacher who retired, and we are going to manage the caseload with existing staff. Um, we had one classroom that was a, a self-contained classroom with a special education teacher for the enrollment numbers student warrant, um, keeping that classroom um, open. So that position was only needed as well. And then one of our grade, the majority of our grade levels are around 50, 50 between 50 and 55, but we did have one grade level um, in our elementary school that was just for some reason, just lower. Mm. So it's only around 35 students. So we're reducing that grade level from three sections to two sections. Um, and then we're taking one of our other grade levels, the sixth grade, which was departmentalized, and reducing that. So you have science, social studies, math, and ELA. Reducing that from four to three, and asking all of those teachers to teach ELA in addition to either social studies, science, or math. So they'll pick up an extra subject. Uh, in that respect so we're you know trying to be Juggling creative well. and, and and make it work and things like that yeah so yeah so unfortunately people online are unable to view this because of the glare will this be available on the school website yeah we can post it on the website we can send it to you if you want to post it on your website as well so yeah do that any other questions anybody has yeah at what point of the student reduction would they consider putting everybody in, into one building? Um, so that's not the first time I've heard that. Um, probably won't be the last. Probably know. not, right? Um, so there's a lot of things to take into consideration when you do that because even though enrollment has declined, I'm not saying it would potentially be out of the question at some point, but there are a lot of um, additional requirements that, and Keep in mind, even when people say there was everybody was in one building, they really weren't in one building because there was a middle school where the high school is for years. There was portable classrooms that students were in. There are other locations. So, um, other than you know, um, many many years ago, there there wasn't truly just one building where everybody was. Um, when I went to school here, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade was up where the high school is now. 
and there was additional portable classrooms. But with that said, um, there's not um, only um, enrollment issues, but you have, have a lot of requirements that didn't always exist. So some students have to be in smaller classes. Some students get, have to get testing accommodations. You have you know, social workers if you didn't have in schools. You have psychologists if you didn't have schools. We have, in, we have counselor, counselors that kids would potentially go to at like Cousin Headwaters who are housed in our school now to provide services to kids and families. So it, you can say, okay, take the numbers, divide it up by the number and say, okay, well, you can all fit in the classrooms, but there's a lot of other variables that come into play when you look at that. Um, so um, it's not as simple as you think it's, and also too, many years ago, any students who had special needs or anything like that went off to someplace else. Right, like we we have to provide programs for them um, in our own schools, and we have to pay for those. So um, any kids, even if they, they struggle with learning or they have behavioral challenges, things like that, we as a public school are so responsible for providing programs for them. The other thing is that if you want to truly offer more opportunities in programs like the trades and things like that, and have additional platform or maybe it's even collaboratively with other districts like our construction trades where other students are able to come to our district you have to have a place for those programs as well but don't they do that in both people so yes um to some degree but also keep in mind that when our students go to BOCES which is a half day program um they're anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes away which means we have to provide transportation. So that's 30 to 45 minutes down, 30 to 45 minutes back. Wouldn't it be better for students if we could provide programs here and they could actually do internships and job experiences here locally rather than sit on the bus for an hour and a half? Well, I guess my question was, what number is it, is it decreases? I mean, I yeah. looked at the demographics, mm -hmm. the average age in Morrisburg is 57 years mm -hmm. old, less than median age. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that moved here today are not having children. They've already had them and they came here from someplace else. I mean, I would think that there's got to be a point at some point in time. Where there's no magic number. I mean, there isn't a magic number. I don't have a magic number for you. I mean, are they considering that down the road that they would? Uh, so here's the interesting thing. So. No, I mean, no, that has not come up in conversation other than, you know, everybody's opinions, um, which you hear a lot. Um, but um, it's, the state could always step in, I guess, at any point and, in, in, you know, impart the requirements on school districts for numbers of students or, you know, years ago, a long time ago, the state spent probably a lot of money on a study about merging school districts together. Um, so potentially, once where Lake George, Bolton, and even North Warren, for that matter, could probably merge into one school district. It's not out of question. It's feasible as far as numbers go. Um, the problem is they have to fix the property tax formula because you can't, because the school districts that um, have to vote to approve currently are always the ones whose property taxes are going to increase. And we all know that nobody's going to vote to have their taxes increase. I wouldn't vote to have their taxes increase. So that's why you look at the number of times Glens Falls and Eight Wind has looked to merge with each other and it always gets voted down. Well, of course it's always going to get voted down because Eight Wind voters are never going to vote to have their taxes increase. So the, the state would have to fix the, the way that um, how property taxes are. Um, so the other thing just to point out is that um, when a building closes in a district because it's happened I mean Glens Falls is shut I used to work in Glens Falls before I was in Winter. they they shut down a couple buildings over the years there's only a cost savings to taxpayers for five years and then that cost goes away your savings goes away after five years it's not a long-term savings it's a short-term saving so the, so the district and the taxpayers would see a decrease for four to five years, and then after that, it would go away. So, I mean, that's the truth. That's the reality. So, it's not. It's not like a oh, you eliminate a building, eliminate school, everybody's taxes are good forever. That's not the case. It's four, it's five years. It doesn't it depend on what you do with the building. This. Well, that would be a town. I mean, that would be what what the school does. Because with the tax savings could continue if you did the right. 
Potentially, I guess. I, I, I mean, yeah, potentially a lot of times it's, it's, a lot of times it's difficult for schools to find, you know, things that. A hundred years ago, before the Hudson Head Water built a new building, there was a lot of talk about mm -hmm. Hudson Head Waters and senior housing in the elementary school. It made perfect sense, but you couldn't get federal dollars. Hudson Head Waters wasn't a little while and had a new building. Yeah. So it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, I think that um, I think that Winswood is situated in a very good place. Um, off of the highway and the resources that we have, I think that it would be better to focus on our efforts on developing housing, affordable housing, for attracting families to our community and trying to get more jobs in our community so the community isn't just a bunch of second homes. That's I'm talking about the APA for a while. I know that, but <laughs> that's my thing. Yeah, okay. so, I mean, they, they, want, they want housing and everything. The state talks that. <laughs> Governor yeah. Holcomb talks that, but you got the APA. Agreed. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome, Mr. Brown. Hope you want to sure. accelerate the meeting a little bit. Okay, uh, we'll, any other comments on the public hearing at all before I close it? Turn it around. Elena Morgan, again, I just wanted to, just did a quick little research. Do we know how many short-term rental licenses there are in Warrensburg? Yeah. I have to look it up right there. 99. 99, okay, so... They're not, all, they're not in the, they're not, let me just, sorry. Go ahead, they're not all in the hamlet. So I just want everybody to realize that they're not all in the town. You're talking about Green Mansion, you're talking about Aldenab, and you know, you have- In the township somewhere. Reaching. So it's not, they're not all in the hamlet. That's right. So okay, I just did a quick search on Data USA, and it told me that there's approximately 1,410 residences or households in the town of Warrensburg. So 99, that equates to about 12% are short-term rentals. Based on that number and the tax revenue they're generating, I don't think that putting restric restrictions on short-term rentals would be a good idea. So I just want to put that in there. Any further restrictions? Thank you for your comments. Anyone else before I close the hearing? Okay, consider it. I, I just want to say on our uh, short-term rentals, other townships are looking to us. We, we, with our ground rules, we That's became right. the, the the community that dug our teeth in and got some good rules in place. And we, we we're having a lot of success. We started out a little rough in the beginning, but uh, we really got it narrowed down. Moving forward, um, when I, I've always said that I. I lived here my whole life and I wanted this to be a community where a kid can graduate from the school and can afford to live here. But uh, that being said, I, I cannot wrap my head around why we would want to invite or look for more poor people to move here. We want affluent people to come and, and, uh, and do well here. And I want people to be able to live. But when I see those declining enrollment numbers, I don't see it as a bad thing. I say, well, you know, people are having less kids. We're people from a bedroom community. These Airbnbs and these rental vacation rental properties are the best kept properties in town. And those of us that just got hit with this rebound, everybody knows about that. Those those people saw some increases in their, their property valuations. And that increase that you folks just showed us that school tax thing is not going to bode well with the people that are sitting home seeing their their uh, their. Uh, assessments go up and they can't even factor it with their eighth grade math education so it's generally you know that's why I, that's why i'm selling myself about an eighth grade education pretty well you know so so i uh we got it you gotta help us a little bit up there because 
if the rollers come down that much, there's got to be more that you can cut. There's got to be something to go away with. Now, that building over there, senior center, or some luxury vacation rentals, I think. You know, we, 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 uh, we get rid of one building, get it off the get off the roll, and, and a five year thing. That's some sort of fuzzy math that came out of Albany, I'm sure, because because if you could if we could take one of those buildings and turn them like that one over there and turn it into something that's a viable money making thing for the community, if somebody's paying taxes on it and attracting the type of people we want. There's no downside to it whatsoever that I could see. Jacob Bryan, Bob, got anything to say? I don't know much about short-term rentals. Um, they're, 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 they're good for the community. It may not be good for the school, but that's not the problem why we don't have kids in school. <laughs> kids are just not, parents are just not having kids. <laughs> so uh, I don't have much to say on that. Okay. And for that, so. Uh, We'll go ahead and close the hearing and move on to the rest of our agenda. Jackie, any thoughts? Um, so you're closing the meeting. The town has short term rental regulations. This, this was uh, somewhat minor changes that would be proposed in the enforcement provisions. Um, the public hearing has been closed. So if, if the board wished to move forward with adopting the amendments to the law, the short term rental law, you could entertain a resolution like that. Now. Move forward right now? You could. You don't okay. have to if you want to. We consider it or, or anything that's obviously on the board. We did provide a resolution in the event you wanted to avoid it. It sounds like it didn't make it into your folders. I no, we don't see it. Or the more um, for consideration if that's something <coughs> we're looking to do. Pleasure, Boyd. Do you want to move on it or I you want to move on it? Well, do we have a tool? Yeah, we have one. We'll move forward, I'll just address Ms. Morgan's uh, comments. She's worried about the violation thing over here. So, so when all the time we went through our rockies period with this thing so far we've only had like one case make it to court yeah so so the idea that we have to worry about you know somebody becoming obviously if they became you know in court all the time for there's a reason for it but most of these things are handled pretty well and the, and the way the rules are seems to be the uh homeowners crack down on it and, and get it get it stopped Moving forward? Yep, moving forward. I'm making a motion. Right, motion. I'm going to make a motion to proceed with it as, as well as written, Bob. Let, let me just ask you this. I know we have a form, and I don't want to drag this out, but should we wait till we have five uh, five people on board? For the well, we're just, we're just taking Jim's suggestions, really, to give, give you them some teeth to minor changes in the, the local law we already have. So it's pretty minor. Would you want to second it, or I'll, I'll second it if you want to second it. What do you want to do? All right, we're good. Going on your be a second at okay. I'll have a voice vote. Ma'am, if you would please. Yes. 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 Very good. Or with changes that were made. Uh, we're going to skip right on to uh, right through the reports and uh, reports of officers and committees. We're not going to do it suspense with those for now. And we're right in the communications we're request from. William, also known as Billy Druzo, to waive a 30-day waiting period to apply for liquor license at Lizzie Key's Restaurant, 89 River Street, Class Warrensburg. Old, old business. We asked people who reside in the water district to try to identify their water line, where it comes to your home, by taking pictures if possible. Please forward the pictures to the town. If you have need help, you can picture, please call the town sewer, water clerk, 518-504-4114. EPA federal government has mandated a service line inventory for each town in October 2024. What's important, mandate if you folks can help us look what water line you have coming in your house. Under new business. Resolution request to waive the 30-day notice requirement for Billy Trousseau for applying for liquor license, uh, Betrues Mad Flora. LLC located 89 River Street Plaza, Warrensburg. Authorizing the supervisor and or town clerk to execute documents, provide notice to the liquor authority, or take other steps necessary to inform the SLA that the notice was received and the town board is in favor of granting the license and that is wavering, waiving the three day 30 day notice requirement. And the resolution. I'll, I'll make that. Okay. Second, Bob? I second. Okay. 
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, there's one by budget, budget modification. Okay, it's just uh, uh, special items and contingent $235 from that to unallocated insurance $235, which covers youth baseball insurance. And lastly, our April warrant, warrant number four, total warrant, I'm sorry, Second. for the bond budget. Second, Bob. For the modification, okay. okay. All in favor, so everybody say aye. 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 And then, of course, the warrant total claims for the warrant are three hundred to two three thousand two hundred sixty four dollars and eighty six cents. Motion to pay the warrant. Okay. Brian, Bob, second. Second. Very good. All in favor, so everybody say aye. 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 All right. Um, any comments from the people in the audience? Anybody? All right. Laura Moore, the Town of Warrensburg Museum. I just want to thank Tracy and the town for fixing the leak that was in the second floor. Uh, it's taken care of. Um, and then our, we had a Soro Eclipse event uh, program at the library as well as the Glen, and that went very well with over 35 participants. Thanks. How about the traffic the other day? Can you believe it? Northbound, southbound, I never saw anything like it. It was worse than the world's largest grass. Apparently, those people have all been for the grass because they knew the back roads. They didn't saw that. Terrible Elm Street, all the way up the back way. Anybody else? Any other comments from the audience at all? Bob, you got anything? Brian, you got anything? Um, My last comment their cemetery is, is technically open now, folks. Our staff, we're staff now. Got a lot of spring cleanup in our town cemetery. Reminder if you have. Christmas decorations and whatnot that you've had, they don't last and they start blowing all over the cemetery. We suggest you, you, if you want them, please come get them before they get disposed of. So that would be a big help for all of us and the staff at the cemetery. So that's that. Joyce? Brush cleanup. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll Second, two weeks in May. You got it in there, Brian? Yeah, that is. You just read the dates, Brian? That, that is important, Mark, because. Some people already have their uh, oh, they are. stuff on the yard. And it's only Monday through Thursday. And they're only doing it the two times, right? Two, two, two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Yeah. I guess we didn't. What did I read? I read this you found it? Yep. Quicker the, quicker the draw. It's on Facebook. There you go. Everything's on Facebook. Absolutely. Yeah, it was on online. Okay. All right. Uh, no, hearing no others. I didn't hear about Six through the ninth and the thirteenth to the sixteenth. Hey, you no know, one here, you know, others. A motion to adjourn. Okay. We'll move. Good day, everyone. Thanks for coming. Good, huh? <laughs> Good, 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 Good